and welcome to our first psychology video. Today we're going to be talking about the history of psychology. We're going to take a look at psychology's pre-scientific roots in philosophy and some of the early fields of psychology. But before we get there, we should probably lay down our foundation of what psychology is and what do psychologists do. So let's go ahead and take a look. Psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. And it's really important that we have both in our definition. It's very easy to see the behaviors of people around us. We can describe them and we can notice them and we can report on them. But we also want to focus on the mental process portion. What is someone thinking that is causing them to act the way that we're seeing them to act right now? We need both to fully understand the human condition. What makes someone who they are and what's going on inside their head? What's going on in your head? So that's what, what psychology is, but what do psychologists do? There are four major goals of psychology. The first one is to describe. As we said, we can see human behavior all over in our world. And the first thing that we can do is we can report on it. But we wanna go further than that and we want to explain. And I would say the big difference between describing and explaining is that when we explain, we seek to understand. What is the reason for the behavior or the thought process that we see? Eventually, we can move to predicting behavior, notice the trends, and see if we can anticipate the way a person will think or act in various situations. And eventually, and in cases where it is to someone's benefit, we can even go so far as to modify, change the way that a person acts or change the way that a person thinks, especially if their thoughts are harmful to themselves or others. How can we change to make it more beneficial for everybody? So how did we get here? Psychology was born of philosophy, and early philosophers sought to understand human condition by trying to explain why we become the people that we are today. And it was really divided into two major camps, our nativists and our empiricists. Plato was a nativist. He believed that knowledge was innate, meaning we were born with it, and that it was through self-exploration and reflection that we came to realize what was already inside of us, the knowledge that we already had. Aristotle, on the other hand, was an empiricist. He believes that knowledge grows from experience, so that as we go out and experience the world, as we trial and error and experiment, that we gain our understanding and that's what creates who we are today. As we move further into the future, we see other philosophers like Rene Descartes, who agreed with Plato and also introduced this concept of dualism. Dualism suggests that the mind and the body are entirely distinct and they communicate through a process of nerves. So Descartes was not far off with this theory at the time, because as we know now, our brain does communicate with our body through our nervous system. And then Francis Bacon landed on the side of Aristotle. He believed that we want, and I always use the word hunger, because his name is Bacon, we hunger to understand and make sense of the world, that we want to be empiricists, that we want to experience as much as we can because that is how we build our understanding and it makes us who we are. John Locke was someone else who agreed with this idea. He used the term blank slate or tabula rasa to explain that we only become ourselves through our experiences. At birth, we are a blank slate, like a blank piece of paper. And each mark that we add to that paper is a different experience, a different moment of our lives that then help to shape us into who we are today. As time goes on and we get into about the mid 1800s, we start to see some new theories about how we can explain why people think and act the way that we do. One of the popular theories that lasted for quite a long time was phrenology. This was introduced by a na man named Franz Joseph Gall. And he believed that if you touch the top of a person's head, the skull and 
examine the bumps and ridges, the size and shape of different parts of our head that we can determine a person's intelligence, their personality, and their character. He was wrong, of course. We know it's not the outside of our skull, but what's going on in the inside that really matters. But this was a very popular pseudoscience for a very long period of time. And unfortunately, it had a lot of negative ramifications from everything from the justification of slavery to anti-Semitism during World War II and the Holocaust. Phrenology was used to justify why some people were better or worse than others. So there was some deeply problematic issues that arose with this popular belief of phrenology. Eventually, we start to see psychology take hold as a science. We start to see actual experiments take place to prove human behavior instead of talking about just general theories or beliefs. Wilhelm Wundt is considered the father of modern psychology. He created the first psych lab in Leipzig, Germany to help understand what he called the atoms of the mind. The experiment he set up was fairly simple. He asked his subjects to press a button when they heard a ball bounce. So as they dropped the ball, a person would tap on a lever. Then he added a second layer to his experiment and he asked people to press the button when they became aware of the sound of the ball hitting the ground. And the very interesting thing that happened was the time that it took for the subject to press the button was delayed. Meaning the time that it took for their brain to register their sound and then become consciously aware of it happened at two different points in time. And so that was the first time that the idea of conscious awareness really came to be in the field of psychology. And from there, his students and his followers started to branch out and create the first two major fields of psychology, structuralism and functionalism. Structuralism was founded by a man named Edward Bradford Titchener, and he focused on, as it says, the structures of the mind. What Titchener sought to understand was essentially what makes up the mind, and how he would do that is through the concept of introspection. So he would have someone reflect after doing a task such as smelling a flower, listening to music, and they would talk about all of the different things that went through their mind as they experienced that. So say you hear a song and it reminds you of your family, maybe a food that reminds you of your grandma's house and it makes you happy. And so as you start to reflect on all of the thoughts that arise, Titchener then used that to say, okay, we have a part of our mind responsible for memory. It also affected your emotion, so there's a part of our mind that's responsible for our mood. The problem with introspection and structuralism is that this would vary from person to person. As you listen to a song or eat a certain food, what you experience in your stream of consciousness is going to be very different from somebody else. And so there is really no way to quantify that. And so it had its limitations. Eventually structuralism would be replaced by functionalism. And this was introduced by a man named William James. And William James wanted to focus not so much on what is in our brain, but what's the purpose? What are the functions of our brain and our senses? How is it functional? How is it adaptive? How does it contribute to our survival? Much like evolutionary psychologists would eventually seek to understand. So instead of looking at just what is inside of our mind, he wanted to understand why do we need these things? If we can recognize faces, what purpose does that serve? Well, it helps us to know who's our friend and who's our enemy. If we can taste different flavors, it helps us to know what is good for us and what could be potentially poison. So functionalism really sought to explain the why. Why does the brain, why does the mind work the way that it does? So to review, structuralism with Titchener is how does the mind work? What makes up the parts of the mind? Functionalism with William James, why does it work the way that it does? 
and how does it help us to survive. That's where we'll stop for today, and next time we'll start looking at the modern perspectives of psychology. Thanks for watching, and just remember, be kind to your mind.